My name is Brian Bangs. I'm an aquatic ecologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm stationed out of Corvallis, so uh, home of the beavers, which is uh, appropriate for uh, the talk today. Um, and I've, I've been there for about uh, 25 years now. So um, I'm primarily a fish biologist. And um, by way of beaver, because of all the incredible things that beaver do for habitat. So today, um, uh, my talk, I, I, I'm, about two t I'm about two times from giving this talk uh, to changing the name from uh, adaptations of beaver, just calling it How to Beaver, because I think it's a much better uh, uh, talk. And that's kind of what we're talking about tonight, is how do, how do beaver uh, uh, exist and how do they manipulate their habitats and what kind of specializations they have that make them ideal for working in these habitats. Hopefully everyone had a chance to grab some food, uh, like this little guy here, and uh, get a chance to, to, to get some dinner. The beaver are um, a hilarious organism. They have, I mean, you look at them and you say, oh my gosh, they have all these little unique specializations that make them kind of animated, you know, a, a, pretty, a pretty cute little organism considering it's a rodent. I think it's eating some cabbage there. This is one at a, at a zoo. And it just keeps going. <laughs> so beavers. Beavers are native to North America. They're the second largest rodent in the world. The largest being the, uh, the capybara. It's down there on the, on the lower right. A lot of people confuse beavers with nutria. And beavers are typically active at night. They're nocturnal or active during the kind of the twilight and the morning crepuscular periods, kind of those, those uh, dawn and, and twilight hours. Oftentimes during the day, you'll see nutria out and about. If you guys ever go down to Basket Slough, Nutria all over the place out there. And of course, uh, you can tell them apart, they're smaller. They have the little ugly rat tail and not the flat tail. And they're just not as cute. I mean, that's just a personal preference. Uh, muskrats are also around here too. And a lot of people will see muskrats and think, oh, we found a baby beaver. And it's like, well, no, muskrats are really a cool organism too. My favorite fact about muskrats is that in areas that freeze over winter, muskrats will be below the frozen ice and they'll come up to the top of the ice to respirate. They can stay underwater for about 20 minutes, come to the top and they'll breathe out all their, their the oxygen in their lungs over the ice. Well, the, the, as they breathe out, they increase the surface area of that where, that, um, where their breath is against the water and the oxygen exchanges with the water and the carbon dioxide exchanges and then they suck it back in. So they can actually breathe underwater with lungs. It's kind of a cool little uh, trick they do to survive frozen conditions. The largest beaver, the giant beaver, was a historic animal. You can see it here in comparison to a man. What does that say? Over three meters long. So it's about, about the appropriate distance uh, for COVID protection. You know, head to tail for that beaver. Um, there's two species of beaver in the world. Um, also obviously our beaver here in blue, the North American beaver. There's also a European beaver. And our North American beaver, it has had some struggles in the past, is doing okay. Not so with the European beaver. The European beaver, beaver excuse me, European beaver is uh, not doing quite as well in its native habitat. There are some areas that are still strongholds. There's areas like uh, the UK and, and um, uh, through kind of southern Europe where they've been extirpated. So um, there's a much more rigorous program in Europe to try to get beavers back into waterways, and um, they kind of celebrate when they see one. Historic range of beaver was basically all of North America that doesn't have alligators. It's a very, very easy way of thinking about it. They were widely trapped for pelts historically, and they were extirpated from some locations in the 16th uh, centuries on. In the west coast of North America, a lot of the early people exploring, the early European uh, explorers to the west coast, were out here to trap beaver and out here to exploit those uh, animals for the pelts. In a lot of areas where beavers were extirpated, they weren't necessarily areas like Western Oregon. They were much kind of brushier and kind of wilder areas. They would actually go inland a little ways to areas that were drier, where the beavers could be um, kind of targeted easier in some of those locations. So there are locations outside Eastern Oregon where we know historically there are beavers, but now they're, 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 they're gone. The diet. I've heard a lot of people say, hey, don't, eat, don't beavers sometimes eat fish? And there was like one recorded occurrence one time of some beavers eating a dead salmon. And so kind of an interesting thing. They think there's probably something missing in the diet of the beaver. Otherwise, no, 100% herbivores. And um, they feed on leaves, on twigs, and uh, cambrium, basically the little outer edge of the bark that's still kind of green and alive of, of trees. Um, they're kind of, we call them just kind of picky specialists, though. They, they like, they, they like um, bark, but they'll also eat other 
herbaceous plants. So, um, you know, uh, any kind of rushes and ferns and things like that, they'll go for a lot of different types of foods, sometimes to the chagrin of local farmers. They cache food and water over the winter. So in places where, you know, you fall a big tree, and next to the, the, the river. They don't have to keep going back and forth out to, the, out to where they fell the tree. They'll actually cut the sticks into little pieces, little manageable bite-sized pieces, beaver, beaver bite-sized pieces, and then drag these back out into the water where they then consume them whenever they want to. So in areas that freeze over, they'll actually take these and cash them down in the mud and then from the entrance there of their den, they can actually just swim underwater, grab a branch, swim back up to their den and eat it without ever having to, have to leave the water. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, I may pass this around. People may not even want to touch this while you're eating. I don't know. Maybe I'll leave it up here and people can see it later. This is a beaver chewed stick I grabbed before this talk. And you can see it, um, the little teeth marks all over it where a beaver has just gone nah, 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 like this, you know, and, and stripped all the bark off of this. And this is a typical size. You know, they'll bring down large trees, not necessarily eating the, the bark on the outside of a large tree trunk, but going for the smaller bark, the stuff that is a little bit more alive, a little bit more green. So, I'll, yeah, thank you. Um, Check it out though, it's pretty cool. You can see all the little teeth marks where the beaver, um, where the beaver been working on this thing. So beaver, I mean, this is why I'm here tonight. Beavers are highly adapted to their lifestyle. You look at a beaver and like every single thing about them is an adaptation to make them just a little bit happier in the water. Their front feet are dexterous. Think of them like, like a raccoon's foot. They can actually handle and manipulate things very well. So beaver dams are oftentimes mud and earth dams that they'll actually pick up the mud and the earth and then you know, jam them into place. They'll pick up rocks and, and you know, pieces of cobble, push those into place. And so they need these kind of highly adaptable little like manipulative hands to kind of push and pull things and get things just right inside a beaver dam. The hind foot looks a bit more like a duck's foot, webbed. Interesting thing about the hind foot, one of the toes right here has a split in it, and that split is a comb. And so the beaver will actually has a gland on it that produces oil, and so it'll rub against the gland, get some oil on the little comb, and then comb its hair. And it waterproofs itself, kind of scotch guards its own fur with, uh, with that oil to make it uh, resilient for water so it can stay warmer in the water. The tail, the beaver tail, obviously one of the, like, the main things about the beaver. It's large, it's flat, right? It's used for propulsion. So going through the water, they can use that, that laterally compressed tail and kind of flop through the, through, through the water, help them propel, propel themselves through the water. They use it as an alarm. So beavers will come up to the surface of the water if they see a predator. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been out on, on a pond and it's starting to get a little dark and a beaver will come up and slap the water. And it's loud, it is like shocking, where you're like, oh my God, what happened? And it's a warning to other beavers in the area that like, hey, something's here, we don't like this very much. And juvenile beavers, like baby beavers, um, every beaver will know the sound of its like family, the sound that the tail slap makes. And baby beavers cry wolf. So baby beavers will come to the surface and slap the water like, ha ah, ha ha, there's a cougar, there's a cougar. And um, other beavers know to like ignore the baby beavers because they're kind of full of, you know, full of BS sometimes. So um, <laughs> over time, I think they probably learned that no cougars are a problem. It's a fast storage, so it's a very fat organ. There's some people who consume beaver tail. It's, uh, you know, uh, the trappers used to eat it because it's just, it's, uh, uh, it has meat in it, but it's, it's full of fat like bacon, essentially. And on land, they can actually use it as a way of helping prop themselves up. So you can imagine you're a little rodent, you want to go up a tree and kind of grab something. They use the tail. It's, it's muscly enough that they can actually pick themselves up and prop themselves up with the tail while they're manipulating um, tree trunk. Their eyes, I mean, you know that we have the old vestigial third eyelid in our eyes. On the little corner of your eye, you have a little pink dot. Historically, you're, you're, you know, in, in, in prehistoric times, uh, some uh, uh, ancestor, that was a nictating membrane that covered the eye, a third eyelid. Beavers still have this. So beavers have a translucent little membrane that covers the eyes and it's essentially goggles. So when they're underwater swimming around, they can pull this shut and they have little goggles for their eyes to help them see. Their ears, their nose are, are highly developed and they can close off underwater, seal out the water from, from getting in their ears and nose. This is kind of a funny thing. I was driving up to Portland today for a meeting and on the radio they said it was National Lip Appreciation Day, which I'm like, really? Like that's such a strange thing. Guess how many pairs of lips beavers have? They have two pairs of lips. And so where we have a pair of lips in front of our, you know, in front of our teeth, beavers have a pair of lips in front of their teeth then behind their front teeth, they have another pair of lips. 
and which is bizarre as can be, but the idea is they can hold a branch under water and swim with it without having their mouth open. So they can close off their mouth and, and kind of separate um, the, the, what would hold onto a branch from the water. It's really cool. And it's also a little weird. And their digestion tract, obviously, it's the, the intestine of the beaver is highly developed. They have very specialized bacteria that live in there and help them break down the woody debris and actually get nutrients from it. So a very, uh, you know, we're not going to show you a picture of that, but a very specialized digestion system to help them break down food and, and get something out of bark. Highly adaptable. So beavers, like other rodents, this is a beaver skull. I <laughs> don't know why I'm not showing this off. That's a beaver skull. So it'll be up here. People can take a look at it. Um, it's like other rodents, beavers' teeth grow throughout their life. Now, you may notice that some of the teeth are white, some of the teeth are, are orange. The orange teeth, uh, these are actually impregnated with iron that helps strengthen them. So many, many rodents have this in their teeth. But it's hard to do this with a microphone in the hand. I got it. Maybe I have it. Oh, we got it. So beavers' teeth grow, out th grow throughout their life, and that is what the beaver's tooth looks like inside the jaw. So inside the jaw, this thing is growing back, clear back into the, the jaw, almost where it hinges on the, on the roof of their mouth here. Um, it's growing clear back from there and it pushes out through life. So beavers in, say, captivity, you have to give them hard you know, uh, wood and that kind of stuff to grind off their teeth. Otherwise, they kind of want to curl back into the mouth and they grow too large. So they actually have to like, kind of control for the growth of the tooth in the mouth. So it's a pretty cool thing. These things will grow, uh, like I say, from, from birth until they die. So beavers, they live in colonies, and colonies can be anywhere from a pair of beavers to about 12, and it's a family unit. Oftentimes what you'll have is an adult, the kids, the juveniles from the previous year's babies, and then another set of babies. And so the you know, age zero babies are kind of helped raise by age one, you know, sub-adults, and the adult parents. But typically reach maturity at about, sexual maturity, about one and a half years old. Beavers will then kind of radiate out into the wild. So beavers um, will move quite a bit. Individual beavers, when we've trapped them and released them locally, we'll see them, uh, some of them move up to 40 miles from where we release them to just go find new habitats. So they like to kind of run roam around a little bit and, um, and find new areas. Uh, they can also be highly territorial. So beavers kind of like, they like their little family unit, they like their resources, and they actually, beavers, one of, the, one of the top things that kill beavers are other beavers, unfortunately. So when we do transport beavers around, we have to be really careful to, to make sure we're not putting them in places that beavers already exist. Reproduction. They form lifelong pair bonds. They have about 100 day gestation. And kits are born sometime uh, January to March, March being in, in kind of colder climates. The females will nurse the kits for the first, say, three or four months of, a of age. And uh, the kits, and this is, of course, a kit, um, not water resistant. You can see it's kind of fluffy. Well, they don't begin producing the, gl the glands that actually waterproof them, don't begin producing um, right when they're born. Actually, it takes a while to develop. And so the kits kind of stay at home until until they develop that waterproofing ability and, and they start waterproofing themselves, kind of following what their parents are doing, and then they can get out in the water. It takes them a little while to grow. Um, and then like I said about the, the, the juveniles kind of um, crying wolf, it takes them a while to kind of pick up adult behavior. So a lot of these are learned from their parents. This is a beaver lodge. There's several types of beaver lodges, but they all share some, some, um, some similarities. All beaver lodges have an underwater entrance. And that's kind of the key component of a beaver lodge, is that it's underwater. And the idea here is it hides it from predators. Not a lot of predators are willing to dive down and hunt and, and find that entrance to the lodge. Cougars locally will dive down six feet into, into the water of ponds to try to hunt beavers. So um, beavers are uh, cougars, coyotes, other kind of large predators hunt beavers locally. And so um, they're, the lodges and the, and the dens they create are to keep themselves uh, safe from beaver. You can see they have an area here which will oftentimes have small twigs, mats, fur, that will, they'll, where they'll sleep and, um, and um, raise their young. Other types, we have kind of lodges that are out in kind of the middle of ponds. So if they make a large pond, sometimes you'll find a, a lodge out in the middle of the pond. Oftentimes, locally, we find lodges on the side of riverbanks. So you'll see a big pile of sticks on the side of a riverbank, and that'll be the entrance to a lodge. And essentially, the beaver will have dug a tunnel under the, the surface of the water, or surface of, yeah, surface of the water, and then up to where it's kind of dry, oftentimes like under a tree or something like that. It'll oftentimes have air vents and things to kind of keep it cozy, and it'll be a bank den. So either you'll have a bank den kind of like this freestanding, or one that's part of a lodge structure like that.
Those are much more common locally than a freestanding lodge. There's a couple places I can think of where we have these. Up at Willamette Mission, there's a couple places down at the William L. Finley uh, Wildlife Refuge, there's a couple. Beaver Dam is probably one of the most iconic uh, parts of, of when we see beaver in the wild, we see their beaver dams, where we see their, the signs of them taking down trees and chewing things. So I got into working with beaver because of the dams. A lot of fish locally require beaver dams to, to kind of do their life history. They require the kind of quiet, calm water behind a beaver dam. So the ecology of dams, not all beavers locally build dams. In fact, a pretty small subset likely build dams. Up and down the Willamette River, no beaver dams, but the water's deep enough in those areas that they can dive down and avoid predators. And so the beaver builds a beaver dam to increase the water depth so that they can, um, and, and kind of keep water present year round so they can avoid predators. Kind of the, the reason they're not making it because they think the ponds are cool, they're doing it to, to avoid predation. A beaver dams and the ponds behind them make it really easy runways for moving sticks and things. You imagine that a beaver, as it goes up towards land to chop down a tree, it's, it's pretty in peril when it's up there on, on dry land. So it wants to flood an area so we can actually fall a tree and pull the sticks out into the water where it's much, much safer and get away from predators faster. They're kind of lumbering and, and, uh, and gainly on land, but they're pretty, they're pretty um, uh, good in water. Beaver dams increase the forage area, so you can imagine that a beaver dam simply widens the river and it uh, creates water kind of year-round in habitats that sometimes wouldn't have water year-round. So it, it creates more forage area for them and the kind of things they like to eat, you know, rushes and forbs and um, uh, cattails, um, uh, early successional trees, young trees, they grow in these kind of habitats that have big swampy dams in them. It's not some like nice pristine mountain stream, it's a swamp. And that's the kind of place that, that are essentially become farms for these beavers. And beaver dams are constructed out of whatever materials available. I've had so much fishing gear, my traps, my seines, my nets, get incorporated overnight into beaver dams. Beavers will see whatever garbage I leave out. I mean, it's not garbage, it's, it's, it's scientific equipment. Whatever kind of scientific equipment I leave out, they'll try to incorporate it back into their dams. They're like, well, that's a nice two by four. I can use that. Whatever's around, they'll use it. Mud, stone, wood, herbaceous plant parts. I've seen them made out of blackberries and Japanese knotweed. So they'll kind of use whatever they, they can get their hands on, whatever they can move to build a dam. It's kind of cute. Oftentimes, it's a, it'll flood a very large area. So beaver are very good at looking at habitats and being like, is this going to be suitable for me? And part of that is the slope of, of the habitat. Basically, if I build a dam here, we'll have a large enough area that it'll protect me. They're good engineers. They like areas that are typically low slope and areas that have low enough water velocity that a flood won't blow it out. So they do build in areas where floods blow them out. And a lot of dams are temporary. Most dams are temporary. And then they are also looking for the food supply. In this area behind it, are there lots of herbaceous plants or areas that are gonna grow herbaceous plants where I can feed? So they kind of, they, you know, not every stream is a good spot for a beaver dam and they're pretty good at picking out the streams that are. Um, so a stream like this, if you were to slap a beaver dam down in the middle of it, it's gonna make a little tiny pool behind it, right? It's like it's not going to be, there's not going to be a lot of water backed up behind a little beaver dam here. But if you have some kind of wide open area and you put a big dam down, well now it's like, yes, you're backing up a bunch of water. So there's kind of a sweet spot where it's either too, too low gradient and they can't really build up a big dam to get enough water backed up to make them a big pool, or areas that are too, that are too uh, high velocity, that are too, uh, have, are too steep, and the beavers actually can't make a dam in those areas. So there's kind of this little Goldilocks zone for beavers in most watersheds. A lot of things we do, beavers look at and say, oh, that would be a great spot for a dam. In fact, a lot of what I do is kind of mitigating human beaver conflicts. So you can imagine that in, on a stream where there's a road and a culvert going across, and a beaver looks at that and says, that's almost a dam. That's almost a perfect dam if it didn't have that stinking culvert in the middle of it. So beaver are really good at, <laughs> at, at assessing these kind of situations, plugging the dam, and then creating a beautiful pond behind it for themselves, flooding out barns or roads or you know uh, people's infrastructure and kind of creating a mess. Oftentimes the, the kind of habitats that we want to have aren't necessarily what the beavers want to have. So a lot of the conflicts we have are based on these kind of things. And they can build these fast. There's a fellow out in the Staten area that had a pond about a culvert this size and he would go out every day and rip it out because it was actually flooding his well. And the beaver overnight would remake it 
every night. And <laughs> he called me so frosty, so ready to kill a beaver. But um, we, were, we were able to, to increase the size of his culvert. We put in, we put in um, some uh, posts above the dam to give the beaver a new place to build a beaver dam. Worked perfectly. The beaver actually went and used the new posts and built a, a much nicer beaver dam. It, 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 it's still there today. So. Beaver dams do a lot of really cool things to the environment. So you can imagine that they increase water tension, uh, water retention, and base flows. So a stream typically follows a natural hydrograph. You have a big rain event like the ones we've been having. All the water's flooded up for a couple weeks, then it goes down. Well, a beaver dam's like a big sponge. And floodplains themselves are like big sponges. They want to hold water. And so a beaver dam slows water down as, it, as it's coming downstream and holds it in this area longer. And while it's slowed down, it allows more time for the floodplain sponges to soak up that water and hold it over time. And so you can imagine that then into dry periods, into the summer, areas with beaver dams stay greener longer and they hold the streams themselves are more permanent than if they didn't have dams on them. So a big key feature for someone who's a fish biologist who wants to have, you know, fish need water and they want to keep, keep water on the floodplain. They also decrease peak flows. So when you have a big flood event, a big storm event that brings in a lot of water, these little catch basins set up on these watersheds hold back water. They actually hold back acre feet of water within them. And so streams, it allows it downstream less flooding, less a kind of acute flooding and more slow water metering out over time. Um, beaver dams, unlike say Corps of Engineers dams, um, are very leaky. <laughs> so they hold water, but they don't hold water super well. And they create conditions that forces the water, so the water does, you know, gravity wants to move the water downstream. It forces the water to go down where it interacts with the substrate and it forces the water to go laterally where it interacts with the floodplain. And so it forces the water kind of away from the stream a little bit. This cools the water. It makes more kind of green riparian habitats around, uh, around these dams. And so it, it increases the complexity of these river systems and, and increases groundwater recharge. It also increases sediment retention. So you can imagine that if, if sediment's being pushed downstream, your gravels and rocks and that kind of stuff, as it encounters a beaver dam, it stops and it backs up behind the beaver dam. So in areas where beaver dams don't blow out, where, where high flows don't wash them away, eventually they fill up with sediment. And it's a way of we can retain sediment in streams and eventually this will build spawning grounds behind these things where you've held a bunch of gravel. They also help with nutrient cycling. So you can imagine that they're holding in, say, say the farmers up on these slopes were, were heavily fertilizing their, their property and nutrients were being pushed down into this. Well, rather than being pulled downstream, they fall out into the dams where a bunch of herbaceous plants are ready to quickly take that stuff up and, and beavers are eating them and turning it over. So it cycles nutrients really fast. Um, and uh, it creates a lot of habitat for fish, amphibians, and wildlife. Riparian zones, the area of the water where the water meets the land. And essentially in a beaver pond, it increases that, that, that interface between the terrestrial and aquatic habitats are increased. And the riparian zones on the habitats, on any, on any habitats locally, are the areas that have the highest biodiversity. So those are the areas where if you go out to a riparian zone, you're gonna find the most organisms than if you were out in a field or if you were in the water. Those are the areas of biodiversity. And beaver, dons, beaver dams and beaver ponds simply expand those areas and make them larger. So pretty cool to a scientist. Um, and they're also the highly productive habitats. Out here in the Lucky Mute, for those of you who are, are local to the watershed, you know that a lot of our streams are incised. And we've had a lot of history of getting rid of beaver dams and straightening channels and simplifying the river system. Humans oftentimes want to get water off the landscape as fast as possible so we can get tractors out on the, on the, on the landscape. We can dry out our fields and work and, and do the kind of things that we want to do. This oftentimes creates incised channels where the water velocity, the velocity of the water is so high that it keeps down cutting the channel over time. And what this does is it creates arid landscapes on the floodplains where a lot of your floodplain plants won't grow. So you put a beaver dam in one of these things, well what happens? Well if the water's too high a velocity, it doesn't work and the beaver dams fail. But when they fail, they cause the, the water, instead of going downstream, these are little speed bumps now. They cause the water to go sideways and jut into the side of the bank and then scour it out, widening a once very narrow channel. And it brings material down kind of into the active channel. Over time, beavers are gonna keep trying this and keep trying to build dams. They're not gonna be permanent, they're gonna blow out. But eventually, these streams will get wide enough that the dams will work. 
and those dams will be successful and be uh, permanent dams year round. At this point, you start to get the, those kind of features I was talking about, retention of water in the floodplain and a recharge of groundwater. You'll get start getting more plant growth. That plant growth simply gives more space for beavers to continue to build beaver dams, more, more material to work with, more um, herbaceous wood to feed their young. So over time, what you want to see, or what we, we, what we want to see in the restoration community and as, as biologists, are these beaver dams that eventually will reconnect with the floodplains. And they'll fill up, they'll fill up the previously incised channel with enough gravel and with enough substrate that this water will raise over time. It'll raise the, the water table and reconnect those floodplain habitats, creating those areas of biodiversity that I was talking about. And they exist out there. There are some of the places where I am lucky enough to work look like this, um, but they're not as many as they used to be in the Lima Valley. So eventually these things become complex braided river networks and eventually, I don't know if I have the eventual slide, I don't, eventually these will fail. Eventually these will become wetlands and wet prairies and, um, and the kind of habitats that other organisms need. Organisms need wetlands. Wetlands are important on the habitat. They'll, the beavers will move on. They'll move to other habitats. And eventually this will down cut again and make habitat where beaver can come back in and recolonize it. So beavers aren't permanent on the landscape. They aren't rather nomadic. And so once they create good habitat, they use good habitat, and it becomes something like this, they'll move on because it won't be deep enough to keep themselves um, safe from predators anymore. What's the timeline for that? The question was, what's the timeline for that? Sadly, it depends on the river. So if you have a system upstream where there's a bunch of sediment coming downstream, timeline's short. If you have a system where upstream is actually pretty complex and you know it's an old growth forest, it's never been long, timeline's gonna be a pretty long time. So um, some beaver ponds in the valley, um, I don't know, I'm thinking of the ones on the wildlife refuges I work, have been there for at least 100 years. So, and uh, some of them fill in pretty fast. I, there's some out in Eastern Oregon where there's not a lot of material to catch uh, any, any, any substrate coming downstream. They'll fill in pretty fast, you know, a couple, a decade, something like that. Yeah, good question. So beavers become a keystone species, and it's because they, second to man, are the, are the species that's most able to adapt its habitat to what it wants. If they're engineers, they're ecosystem engineers that are able to create habitats that, that suit their lifestyle the way we do, except for they're making them in ponds and sloughs and bogs and on rivers. So beavers and these dams they, they create are such unique habitats that they support a wide variety of species locally that, that utilize them, and that's why we call them keystone species. Um, locally, I'm, I'm an Oregon chub biologist. I, I spent 15 years working with Oregon chub, and first fish that was delisted in the United States was done here locally. And Oregon chub need these habitats. They're, we call them floodplain obligate species. They live almost entirely in beaver ponds. I can't think of a chub habitat that's not also, not also a beaver habitat. They just kind of go hand in hand. Chinook and our other salmonids also utilize these habitats. They're highly productive. These little beaver ponds, it's going to surprise no one to say that a little swampy pond produces lots of insects. And uh, chinook and steelhead, coho, trout, they go gangbusters in these habitats. And you'll oftentimes find them much larger utilizing these kind of swampy slough habitats than you would if they were just out in a river um, scrounging for food. So I'm going to go through a couple slides. And Suzanne made it sound like that perhaps we're going to have some more talks on this topic. But Number one thing that is, is causing us issues right now, of course, the conflicts with humans. And near me, there's a culvert right now when it was raining that, oh, clearly a beaver, beaver plugged up. The whole road was flooded over. And it's like, yeah, they, they create a lot of conflicts. I alluded to the culvert one. Beavers also chop down a lot of trees. And so if you live along a river or if you're farming, say, an orchard near a river and beavers are coming up and chewing down your trees, you might not be quite the beaver believers um, that I am. So there's a lot of conflicts with, with humans, and a lot of what we do is try to reduce the amount of conflicts people have with beavers. And so there's, there's some pretty ingenious ways that have been developed recently to do so. With the trees near streams, cages work pretty well. And I, that's kind of like, well, no, no, no low, low tech. But actually getting money out to farmers to buy fencing material to build these cages or, or just putting them on the landscape, getting the manpower out to put them on the landscape, that's what we oftentimes can help with. So getting them out there, caging some of these prized trees so that they don't just level a forest <laughs> near, a, near, near a river is actually something that is kind of ideal and it keeps people kind of at peace with beavers. One of the ways when we have a beaver dam and it's say flooding a road or flooding a culvert, we could put in these things called beaver deceivers. And what they are is a large flexible tube, a big pipe, that you go out to the beaver dam, you notch it. 
to the, and so the notch is at the elevation that you want the water to be at. And as long as the den, the mouth of the den is underwater, this will work. And then you put this, you put this tube over, over the dam, and it extends out into the, the pond. And you want it out, you know, maybe this is not very far. You want it out maybe 20 feet out of the pond. It's caged off so the beaver can't get into it, and you try to keep the beaver out of it. But the idea is it'll lower the water elevation in the pond. And beavers are, have a really keen sense of hearing. So when there's a hole in the pond, a beaver's not out there looking for the hole. It's listening for the hole. And so it'll go out and listen very carefully and try to figure out, well, where's the water coming through? And it'll go in and pack that area with mud. And so when you have a, the, the opening of this tube is out here in the pond, you drill holes in here so you don't get cavitation. And then the, the, the hole is out here in the pond. It's actually where the drain is happening. The beavers won't go this far away from their, their uh, dam to look for that. And so beaver deceivers. The other way is kind of using beaver's biology against them. So beaver ponds, you can imagine if this is, this is a, supposed to be a culvert right here and a road, and water's coming down this way. Well, beaver ponds, they want to make them like any other engineer. They want to make them kind of arch-shaped this way, which is kind of structurally the way that you'd want to make a dam to hold back water. It'd have, it would have the best um, ability, the engineering would be the best to hold back water. Beavers don't want to build kind of trapezoidal shapes in the opposite direction of that arch. And so beavers will come across the front of, a, of an area like here and build a dam, and then they might extend off the sides of this thing, but then you have open areas around the culvert that allow water to flow in and um, reduce flooding. So a couple ways you kind of use beaver's biology against them a little bit, but it really reduces the conflicts with beavers. And you can imagine that if you didn't have these in place, the old school way of getting rid of beavers is to trap them or shoot them. <laughs> so these are preferable. And we, we think that it's always best to have beavers on the landscape and, and do these kind of tricks than to take them off the landscape. Um, once beavers make a beaver pond, it becomes, they, like I say, a beaver will move like 40 miles, up to 40 miles to find habitats. It's kind of like getting a mouse in your house. Like if you trap a mouse in your house, you say, yeah, I got the mouse. But you kind of know, like, well, there's still a hole somewhere that a mouse is coming in. Or there's still food it's, it's smelled and it tried to come in. Once you get a mouse, you kind of always keep the trap out. Well, this is how beavers work. Like once you make beaver pond habitat and has all those features beaver want, if you kill the beaver, more beaver will come in. They are rodents after all. So doing these kind of things is more successful long term than, than trapping. And oftentimes it's going to be cheaper, we've come to find out. Translocation is something we do. So there's up in Portland in the, the stormwater networks up in Portland, beavers have taken off in these things. They'll dam up the storm networks flooding out Portland streets. The Bureau of Land Management actually has areas outside of Crabtree Creek, kind of out towards the Lebanon State area, where um, beavers have been extirpated, and they want to put reestablished colonies of beaver out there for amphibians. And so we've actually been trapping some of the problem beavers out of the Multnomah channels and moving them up to, to Crabtree Creek and re releasing them. Those have been successful. Translocation is not always successful, though, so we kind of want to keep beavers in place. Like I say, they want to move out of the areas you put them into. There's a lot of conflicts, kind of beaver on beaver conflicts. And without a dam in place, you're kind of setting them up to get eaten by something if they can't quickly establish a dam. So kind of in their best interest to stay in place, but this is a useful tool, especially to get them reestablished in areas. One of the things we do, because beaver dams provide a lot of ecosystem benefits, is make fake beaver dams on the landscape. And so you can imagine areas where beavers have been extirpated or, or just aren't prevalent, or their habitats aren't prevalent. One of the things we can do is put wooden kind of, we call them beaver dam analogs. And basically they're poles put into the river where we weave, um, we weave wood, and we kind of put wood and stone behind it, and it makes a little fake beaver dam. And you might say, well, that sounds like a real waste of time. But what it does is it achieves all the same things Beaver Dam does over short periods of time. And so it gets you the lateral floodplain connectivity. You'll get sediment accumulation behind those beaver dams. And you'll get a lot of the early cereal stage um, growth that you get in beaver dams. And so oftentimes, it'll make this area attractive to beavers. And so then you'll get beavers coming in and colonizing an area that you kind of set up for it. And you'll get beavers kind of reestablishing themselves and then using those things to make their real dams. So it's a way of kind of getting beavers back into habitats where you want them. One cool thing that came up, this is off Highway 84, up in kind of the Gresham area. The city of Gresham up there put in a water quality facility where water was being drained off this big industrial park. 
And 2007, 2008, they spent $2.4 million to build this facility to keep heavy elements, lead and other uh, kind of toxic elements, from getting down into the Columbia River. And the whole facility was set up as kind of this highly engineered to slow water down in here and get a lot of those things to fall out of suspension before the water hit the Columbia. This is how they engineered it. Water kind of would go into the system and just slowly weave its way around these channels. Well, Beaver found it. And Beaver said, well, we can do this, we can do this better. And so Beaver came in, they built up these beaver dams, these big beaver dams. They plugged all the holes, they plugged all the ditches that were dug in there, and they kind of made this them their own. And slowed the water down even more, but the pathways of water didn't weave anymore. They just slowly kind of eked through these beaver dams. Well, city of, of Gresham said, well, wait a minute. What's this actually doing to the water quality? Is it actually achieving what we want to do with the water out here? And turns out that without beaver dams, they were getting you know, up to about a 40% removal of pollutants from, those, um, from the water that was spilling from the industrial park out towards the Columbia. With the beaver dams, it was slowing down the water so much more, and they were going through such, so much more of a filter bed, essentially, they were getting like 60% removal of toxicants from, from those beaver dams. So they actually, it's kind of a cool story, where the beavers were actually working better than the engineers at kind of removing sediments. The one thing that didn't improve was the actual amount of suspended sediment in the water, because, well, it's a, it's a swampy beaver pond. So um, that's probably not the biggest thing, though, compared to pesticides and lead and copper and the other things they were trying to control for. So, Kind of a cool story, and it's one of those, um, uh, one that the engineers up there share, it's, uh, uh, the, the city of Gresham engineers kind of share, is like, a, hey, we learned to live with beaver. Go ahead. That's a good question. So the question was, well, how did it affect the beavers to be around all those horrible toxic chemicals? And probably not the best for them, but um, they also live in some pretty awful areas sometimes, and the, you know, they chose to, to, to move into those habitats, into the area that's supposed to filter the water before it um, they'll live like, you know, the five to nine, the uh, question was how long do beavers live in that like five to nine year range, somewhere in there. So, um, yes, they might be, they might be damaged by this, but um, it's also, they moved into the area that's supposed to clean the water too. So that's kind of my presentation, guys. Um, I have this, uh, this little comic on here. There's my email address. If you guys have questions or stories about Beaver or things like that, I'd love to hear them and, and talk more about it and answer questions. But um, there, I'm going to talk on Beavers. So um, thank you all so much for coming and um, hope you guys have other questions.